Hi there everyone, this is DJ from GarageFront.net Academy. Welcome to the second part of the Edgy Neon Motion Graphics tutorial. In this part, I'll show you how to create the particles flowing effect and also add some camera motion to make the thing more dynamic and interesting. This is the start of a short mini series of a motion graphics tutorial. So if you're interested in that, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification button so you don't miss the next ones. In the end of this tutorial, I'll also show you how to use our Blender friendly render farm service to render out your sequence very fast if you're in a hurry with a deadline. It can save you a lot of stress and you will not have to pay a lot. So stay with me and let's jump straight into Blender. So first let's make our neon glow. If we wanted to do that in Eevee, that would be pretty easy. Just turning on bloom effect and there you go, it shines. But in Cycles, it's a little bit more sophisticated because when you just render out a shiny object here like with an emission shader, it comes out pretty flat even if you crank up the value of the light. The light will have effect on the surrounding objects, but it will not have this glowing effect around. Well, you could play around with volumetrics, but it's really heavy on calculations. So let's use Compositor, let's turn on Use Nodes, and there we have our render layers. So if you have rendered your scene out, it will show up here. And just let's uh, use the backdrop to see what we're dealing with. And to enable the viewer node, we'll use the sh shortcut from Node Wrangler add-on, which is Shift, Control, Left, click over the node. And you can use that trick for any node that you want to preview in the viewer. So it's pretty useful whichever nodes we are dealing with. Now let's add a node for our filter effect. And this will be the glare filter effect. Exactly this one, let's plug it in and boom, there we go. We can see it glows, but it glows uh, with the streaks as default, so it's kind of like not the effect we want. Let's use the fog glow instead. And we can see it's pretty nice and kind of like the bloom effect in Eevee. But let's set up uh, the quality to high and it will be a little bit more subtle. And we can also play with the threshold. The threshold really means which values in the image will be having an effect on the glare node. So if you want to limit this just to the emission uh, objects, you can set up a threshold. You can even set it up just to super bright parts of the image, setting up the threshold high. Then you can also play with the mix. You can see the tips here, which pretty much explain what it does. And you can play with the size of the glow effect is a minimum of six, and I think we can go with a seven. Just remember before uh, before running the final render to plug in your setup also to the composite node because it will have the effect on the on the final output of your render. And I also quickly added a background plane for our scene uh, using the same shader as for the text object in the which I created in the first part. Just changing the color a little bit, plugging in a node with a color mix, adding some purple color to this. Now let's add some particles. So let's add a plane as an emitter. Let's rotate it and put it on the side so that we'll have the stream of particles flowing from the left to the right side of our scene. I'll put it here and now with the plane selected, I'll go to the particle settings and click the plus sign to have my particle system. And they are falling down right now, so let's uh, Turn down the gravity to zero, and now we're floating in space freely and quite slowly. As you can see, the particles have a low and constant velocity, so let's take care for that. I'll crank up the velocity to five meters per second, and it will be a little bit faster. That's what I want. And I'll also increase the lifetime of the particles, so that means that particles will disappear just after 200 frames. Now you might notice that the particles are starting to flow from frame zero and they are kind of like entering our scene, which is not what I really want to achieve. I want the effect to be kind of like infinite from the very first frame to the very last frame so that the particles quite evenly fill the whole camera view. And to do that, I'll uh, change the frame start to minus 100 so that Blender will start calculating the whole uh, particle simulation on frame minus 100 and I'll also increase the lifetime to 500. Now I'll just add a few planes, copy those, and apply our blue, green, and red shaders to these. So I'll have like flow, uh, like shining little stripes flowing instead of these 
halo little dots. So I'll also put these into a new collection. I'll call it RGB. And we'll use that later. Right now, let's select our particles again. And in the settings, let's find the render tab. And it set, it set the render as halo. Let's change it to object. And let's pick one of the objects we created. And now we can see the particles emitted are using the objects. Uh, it's not rotated the way I want, so I'll rotate it and apply all transforms. And now the particles are rotated the way I want. I also introduce some scale randomness to this and increase the scale of the object. Just to make those stripes a bit bigger. Yeah, I quite like it. But right now we're just using the blue one, so let's change it and use the whole collection instead. So let's change object to collection and pick the RGB collection. And right now it's picking random objects from the collection and that's just the effect I wanted. And now I'll just crank up the number of particles so they feel the scene more. And we can see that there's a whole wave of starting particles right now, but that's just because uh, calculation is made uh, from not from the frame zero. We have to fully calculate the whole simulation so that this effect won't appear. Let's put in some random values to that as well. And let's also enable depth of fields so we have a more feeling of depth in the scene and the particles close to the camera will get blurry. Let's pick the frame stop to a lower number that will increase the effect of the depth of field. And let's render out a test frame just to see if it works. You can see we have this nice DOF effect. Now let's make our camera move to make the whole motion graphics a little bit more dynamic. And to do that, I'll uh, use a helper object uh, and empty. So let's add it quickly in the middle of our scene. Add empty and we'll use it as a camera target. So let's call it accordingly cam target. And now uh, with my camera selected, I'll use a constraint track to and pick my target object. You can do that with a picker or from the list. And right now you can see that there's a dashed line here between the camera and the camera target. So there's a relationship between them and it's uh, causing the camera to always point at the target. One thing that is tricky with its setup of the up axis is to Y and when you move the camera across the Y axis it just mirrors so it gets quite tricky but if you use it with caution and you know don't cross the Y axis it acts just uh, without this strange wiggly effect. Now let's just move the camera to some points like on the first frame maybe here. Add a keyframe of the location and rotation. Let's move it somewhere else on the, on the frame 34. Add another keyframe and maybe somewhere down the line here also. So now you can see Blender automatically calculates the movement between the frames. Let's maybe add another one on the end of the timeline. And to do that, we'll copy the first keyframes. Copy keyframe. And now here, let's make it paste. You can also paste it flipped with a reversed order of values, but we'll just paste it normally. And you can see the camera flows quite nice. And now what if I want to change the way the movement between keyframes behaves? There's a way uh, of changing the interpolation of uh, the keyframes. So just pressing T uh, and with hovering over the timeline. Now when we change that, you can see the movement is calculated differently. So you can use the uh, Bezier, which is kind of like an easy in, ease out movement between keyframes. Let's maybe view it on the graph editor. So let's quickly set up a graph editor here. And you can see a visual representation of this whole interpolation stuff between keyframes. You can see that setting it up to constant makes it kind of like linear. You can even set it up to just jump, jumping hard between keyframes. You can also have some nice dynamic effects for that. You can see this kind of like a bouncy elastic effect. Quite nice. 
of course, you can also tweak these curves yourself in the editor to change the, the motion. Now let's take care for some basic settings of the render. Turning off the caustics, we don't need them in this scene. I'll set up the render uh, sampling to something quite low. Just for a test render. And I'll render it in 4K to see all the details. Now it's quite nice, but let's fix the small issues with the plane visible here. So let's move it farther away. We're pretty much ready to render this out. But I also wanted to introduce one more effect that will make our animation nicer, which is motion blur. As you can see, the particles are moving quite fast. So, so motion blur is, effect, is an effect that most of you probably is, uh, are familiar with. It's a simple thing that the eye uh, is seeing things blurred if they move really fast. So if you wave your hand before your eyes, you can see motion, what motion blur really is. We want this effect to be visible on our, on our particles as well as the whole animation, just to make things seem more realistic. And to enable this, you go to the render settings and take the motion blur. You can also change the settings, but we'll leave a default right now. It's fine. Let's render a test frame to see the effect. And you can see these uh, particles get blurred in the direction where they are moving. Before rendering this whole animation out, uh, let's make sure that our particle simulations simulation is stored in cache on the disk. So let's first save the Blender file we're working, working on and then set up the cache. So the whole caching idea is about saving the uh, particles or whatever simulations you have in Blender um, to disk. So uh, it's stored in files on your disk instead of just uh, having the simulation calculated on the render time. Uh, when you calculate this live in Blender, it just stores them in uh, your RAM. And this will be especially important when we are going to send the files to render on a farm. So we have to have the cache files saved. So we can see that there are frames in memory right now, but we'll do that from the start. So let's set up the disk cache and let's press bake. Now I'm going to show you how you can speed up the render process with our the render farm service, you can get the 25 starter credit if you haven't tried us out yet. You have to register here. I'll leave a link in the video description below as well. And you can create an account. And once you log in with your credentials, you can go to the download sections and download a proper plugin for your system. So I'm using Windows here. Once you install uh, our render BML application, we'll, which will help you uh, upload your projects to the farm, you'll also be able to install a Blender plugin that will uh, prepare the scene and send it off to the farm. So let's make sure that we have our output set up before we send everything to farm. And also be sure to make a test render on your own PC before using an online farm. And once you hit the beam it up, it will pr prepare the scene and send it off to the farm. You can submit it here and will be guided straight to the web browser based render manager. Then you can set up a test render with step. So here we have uh, from frame first to 150th with a step of one, which means every single frame, but we'll set it up to something like maybe 50 so that every 50th frame will only get rendered. So we have a good preview of what's going to be rendered. We'll use the GPU uh, because, you know, Cycles is better with GPU and you can also change the samples. Let's use a low sample count so that the test renders will not go too long and will not cost a lot of our free credits. Then when you run the job, it will show you the progress. You can see that we have three frames rendering right now. That's just enough for testing if everything's working fine. Once they are done, they will be automatically downloaded to your hard drive and you can plug them inside your compositor and check how they look like. If everything's fine, then you can just clone the job and submit the final render. Let's crank up the samples some more to have a better quality and set the step back to one so that all the frames get rendered. I've rendered pretty quickly and it cost only three bucks. So definitely free credits will be enough for you to render out a test job uh, with this tutorial project. And if you're in a hurry with a deadline on some more serious project for a client, you can see that it's definitely worth it to have some more render power under your fingertips whenever you want it.